how to do the pathophysiology mind map, okay, for students. This is the systematic study of the disease process. How the disease progress from its cause down to its signs and symptoms and complications. And mind mapping means to lay out, right? To lay out and to sort out concepts about the topic. So you're going to lay out and sort out the concepts about the topic. For example, today is ischemic stroke. So all the concepts pertaining to the disease, all right? The causes, the signs and symptoms. Then you're going to present relationship among the concepts. How does it proceed? Sequencing the cause and effect relationship, all right? And... What are the elements of pathophysiology? What are the things you need to include in your pathophysiology map? All right. Number one is the etiologic factor or the causes. Number two, the pathophysiologic process involved. Number three, the signs and symptoms. Number four, diagnostic tests. Number five, the treatments like medications, IV fluid therapy, and others. And finally, nursing diagnosis and complications. Okay. Let us discuss first the uh, etiologic factor. Etiologic factor, this is the cause of the disease, okay? So we have first the predisposing factor, okay? And the predisposing factor, it pertains to the inherent factors in the person, all right? Like number one, the age of the person, all right? There are some diseases for example, the older the person, the more he is predisposed to a certain disease. Or it could be the other way around. The younger the person, the more he is predisposed to the disease. All right. Number two, the gender. Okay? Different diseases have different uh, gender predisposition. All right. Male might be predisposed to a certain types of diseases which is not common for female and the other way around. Family history. Certain uh, familiar predisposition runs. For example, a patient who have family background of hypertension. Okay? There is a more increased risk for a certain person belonging to a family who have hypertension as its familial predisposition. The, sec the, the fourth one is race. Race means to say it could be the Africans, Americans, Caucasians. Even obesity is part of the pre predisposing factor. And the other one is the lifestyle of the person. Lifestyle like lifestyle. having a sedentary lifestyle. Again, the key word for predisposing factor, it is inherent. Yani, it is within the person himself. Okay? Now, what you have to do, you have your medical, surgical, nursing textbooks, and you have the literature in the internet, okay? You can read something about the predisposing factor of ischemic stroke, but in the concept map that you will be required to do, you, you will only include the ones present in your patient. You can check out the history of the patient and the demographic data of the patient. This is where you can find the predisposing factor, okay? The second one is the precipitating factor, which means that something that triggered the problem. For example, is stress, okay? A person under stress might develop a lot of diseases, okay? So stress can be a factor, correct? Next, when the person is having weak immunity, non-compliance to treatment regimen, for example, the diet of the person, she was previously advised by the doctor on low salt and low fat diet, but she did not comply with it, or non-compliance to medication. Fourth one, 
pre-existing disease. Maybe the patient already have high blood pressure, diabetes, heart diseases, heart attack or stroke, chronic respiratory disease, or cancer. And finally, a certain uh, allergen, allergens to food, to environment, and to other substances. From the list given by the book or the literature, include only the one that is present in your case or in your patient. Okay? You can find it in the history taking and the demographic data of the patient. Okay. After you have identified the possible causes of the disease, as in predisposis, predisposing factors and precipitating factors, it is also important for you to identify the pathophysiologic process involved. It establishes the cause and effect relationship or explains how the manifestation occur. For example, here, the case of acute glomerulonephritis. The first circle right here, the person have a history of post-streptococcal infection. This leads to antigen-antibody complex formation, which deposits in the glomerular base membrane. Because of the antigen-antibody complex in the glomerular base membrane, there is a derangement or inflammation of the glomerular base membrane. Because of this derangement, this causes the glomerulus to increase its permeability to red blood cells, causing hematuria and causing proteinuria. Okay? And hematuria and proteinuria, these are the manifestation. The pathophysiologic process is the antigen-antibody complex formation and the derangement of the glomerular base membrane. We start first with the precipitating factor right here. This is the cause. So it ends up with hematuria and proteinuria. This is the effect or the manifestations or the signs and symptoms. Before the signs and symptoms occur, there must be a process involved. And this is the pathophysiologic process. It involves antigen-antibody complex formation and the derangement of the glomerular base membrane. Where can you get these pieces of information? You can take it from your medical surgical nursing books or literatures in Medscape and other internet reliable sources. Let us proceed with signs and symptoms. For the same pathophysiologic process, of course, in your book, there is a long list of signs and symptoms. You don't need to put it all in your concept map or your mind map. Only the ones presented by your patient in the hospital or the ones given in the scenario. Only the ones okay. specified in the scenario are the ones that you need to put in your pathophysiology mind map. Okay? How about diagnostic tests and lab investigations? History of post-reptococcal infection, antigen-antibody complex formation, causing derangement of GBM. Derangement of GBM causes hematuria and proteinuria. The hematuria causes depletion of red blood cell level, causing pallor and syncope, and causing tachycardia and tachypnea. Okay, look here. Hematuria and proteinuria can be confirmed using which laboratory investigation? It is urinalysis. Okay, depletion of red blood cells can be verified by using complete blood count examination, correct? So this is how you affix the diagnostic test or laboratory investigation in your pathophysiology track. You may want to involve or use different shape or different colors, okay? Next for the treatment, all right? In the treatment, you just affix the treatment ordered by the doctor on your patient. You don't need to put everything that is listed in the books, okay? Let's add here the diagnostic test and laboratory investigations ordered by the doctor. And then the next one is let us add the treatments involved. Example here, antigen and antibody complex formation. Because of this, the doctor ordered corticosteroid and plasma pharesis. And finally, you can add nursing diagnosis 
and connect it with the signs and symptoms and the complications, okay? From the different uh, signs and symptoms, you can further connect it with nursing diagnosis. For example, depletion of red blood cells, pallor, syncope, tachycardia, tachy ineffective tissue perfusion. How about here, proteinuria and hematuria. This can be also, this can also come with uh, oliguria. Okay, altered urinary elimination. This is the nursing diagnosis that you can affix right there. Patients with acute glomerulonephritis might exhibit and manifest hypertension as well. There might be also some formation of edema. Okay, why? Because the fluids is not successfully passed out in the urinary system. And you can involve in the pathophysiologic process which nursing diagnosis if there is edema. Fluid volume excess so you see the more branches that you make from your pathophysiology it means to say that the greater learning that you have in your given scenario okay so this is how you do your uh, pathophysiology